Ladies and gentlemen, it is April the 22nd, 2022, and that's a lot of twos, and four is divisible by two, by two. And we are going to talk philosophy, but before we begin, we will have some mood music just to get us in, get us in the mode. I don't know if I've heard this before. The artist is Explore, and the track title is called Unknown Prophets, featuring Braille. Don't you ever feel like screaming at the top of your lungs for no reason? In the middle of a crowded place, and people stare at you like you're from outer space. And don't you ever feel like dreaming, trying to grab something when you can't quite reach it? But you know that if you work a little harder, you might be able to get it if you stretch a little farther. And don't you ever feel like taking a risk, even if it really doesn't make any sense? How will you ever know what you're capable of if you don't step outside of your box? Other way around, I should call you. And don't you ever feel so overwhelmed? Send out an SOS, but won't know what Or do you mean the song? Oh, the song is called Explore. Got it. But in these days, you feel quite the opposite. Far from a pessimist, more like an optimist. You love the grind and the feeling of accomplishment. Your light shines and you beam with such confidence Don't you ever get the urge to want to open doors And see what lies behind the ones that were closed before Don't you ever want to change what you're going for And don't you ever get the feeling that there's so much more Yeah, so dare to explore And challenge yourself to reach heights you've never seen before Go ahead and touch the sky Life is much too short Don't ever settle for less If you want it, the world can be yours Yeah don't you ever feel like moving away to a place where they don't know your name or face? Leave everything behind but you want to case. Take what you love and the rest replace. And don't you ever feel like starting from scratch? Erase every mistake you made in the past. Slow life down when it's moving too fast. Change your direction, avoid the crash. And don't you ever feel like taking a leap? Don't you feel trapped inside of someone unique? Caught in the same routine every week. Feeling like your life is so incomplete. So don't you ever feel like breaking the mold Trying something new and letting go of the old Take a different path and not the same old road You gotta take a risk if you plan to grow Yeah, so dare to explore And challenge yourself To reach heights you've never seen before Go ahead and touch the sky Life is much too short Don't ever settle for less If you want it, the world can be yours Yo, the world can be yours Everyone's got a gift, but what you going to do with it? Uh, uh, everyone's got a gift, but what you going to do with it? Uh, uh, everyone's got a gift, but what you going to do with it? Uh, uh, everyone's got a gift, but what you going to do with it? Uh, I don't want the whole world, just a piece of it. I don't want the whole thing, you can keep it. I don't want to try to carry the weight. Give me three wishes. Be patient and wait for me to decide. I got dreams, but most of them will push it aside. Don't push me off the edge unless you're sure I can fly. But if you're so sure, how come I can't see the same potential in myself when I look at the man in the mirror and I feel so inferior? Insecure because my security was shattered when I answered the call. It stood face to face with the truth. There's no way to return to the day. So my youth, only a coward runs away and escapes from reality. A coward backs down when the situation is challenging. So the power of love will define my courage when I seek your faith and find my purpose. Yeah, so dare to explore and challenge yourself to reach heights you've never seen before. Go ahead and touch the sky. Life is much too short. Don't ever settle for less. If you want it, the world can be yours. Everyone's got a gift, but what you going to do with it? Uh, at some point, everybody's going to fail, but will you give in or refuse to quit? Uh, and everyone's got dreams, but... What you gonna do with yours? Don't you ever feel like I said don't you ever feel like Yeah I want so much more I want so much more Don't you want so much more? Yeah, so dare to explore Challenge yourself to reach heights you've never seen before. Go ahead and touch the sky. Life is much too short. Don't ever settle for less. If you want it, the world can be yours.
Nice. That is the track titled Explore by Unknown Prophets featuring Braille. Dare to Explore. He said, everyone's got gifts, but... And it sounded like everyone has a gift, but... <laughs> but I think he meant, however, in terms of but, rather than someone's rump. I'm going to call Eche Fatum here. We're going to figure out what's going on. Hello, hello. Hey, all. Is this Eche Fatum? Yes, I think so. How are you? I'm doing well, a bit stressed out with preparation for vacations and getting everything running for the World Economic Forum, which will happen in my absence, but I'll still have a bunch of work doing it. So a lot of organizational stuff, which is not my favorite. So you'll be telling other people what they're going to be doing during it? Exactly. Oh, so you're playing StarCraft. <laughs> yeah, kinda. Well, that was a cool song you shared. There were some themes there. The main one that resonated with me was the struggle between monotony and change. And how for any person's life, having routines and habits and repetition gives us a lot of security, predictability, and stability. But gone too far, it can make things really boring and repetitive where it's no longer fun. But if you did a different thing at every moment of your whole life, it would just be crazy and there would be nothing to kind of hold on to. Well, you could argue that you never step into the same river twice, that even though you're doing the same thing every day, it's always a different experience. Mm -hmm. But I would say so as well, that you, you don't want to overdo it with always doing new stuff, but you always, you also don't want to just keep doing the same stuff over and over again, mm -hmm. especially if it's not successful. I think that's, that, that's the biggest issue. If you're doing the same thing over and over and you're not getting anything good out of it, you probably should change your ways. True. Yeah, I thought this would be a good song to kind of get us into what I wanted to talk about today, which is to return to one of the essential questions of philosophy, and that uh, is how we should live our life. And there's no solution that is kind of overarching would fit for everyone, but there's good ideas on what we could change or where we would want to change things. I'm just exploring this a bit. I thought it would be fun and it's a good distraction from all the other things going on these days. Change, good or mad, or how much? I'm the kind of person, just like personality wise, where I'm pretty happy doing similar stuff for long periods of time. like being a StarCraft streamer for a long time, or when I play Dota, I tend to hone in on a few heroes that I like and just play them over and over again. So I like repetition and I like seeing the differences, like the smaller differences within a set of repetition rather than like picking a different hero every game or playing random in StarCraft. I kind of dial into something that I like. I have oatmeal pretty much every morning for breakfast when I'm at home. I'll mix up the fruit that I put in with it, so there is some variation there. But I've known people who like a lot more variety than I really seek out. I guess when you're saying that you repeat playing Dota with the same heroes, um, it's also a question of what's your approach each and every time. Like, are you trying to to hone in on a specific, um, what is it, set of items, I guess? I usually play the same role. So I'm playing like a one or a two, which would either be the hard carry or the mid, which means it requires a lot of 
farming and it gets stronger as you get more items and that kind of a thing. So there is a, a common theme between the things that I like to do. I guess my question would more be, and uh, probably easier for me to put it in StarCraft terms, that even though you're doing the same task, you're still, you're trying to improve, you, you're going at it with a mindset where you, where you're not just stale within the game, but you're, you're constantly uh, trying to change something up about your gameplay. Yeah, you I always also... have a practice emphasis. That's one of the best anti-tilt measures like as a preventative measure is to figure out for any session of a game that you're playing or any skill like if you're trying to learn painting or writing or something is that it's always going to be kind of scuffed and if you go into it with a performance oriented mindset of I'm ready for this to be my best ever I'm expecting an upswing I've been held back at this rank for too long you're going to set yourself up to get really mad if that doesn't happen but if you have a practice oriented mindset like for this character that I'm playing now, there's a phase of the game where I'm pretty weak and I want to try to work on that. So I'm trying to improve my farming techniques and stuff uh, with the character, which means that whether I go up or down in MMR, that doesn't really matter because in a win game or a lost game, I can still practice those things. So I'm trying to change something about myself and my gameplay, basically. I guess this brings us nicely to a, a first question, which would be, are we to ourselves morally obligated to, to push our limits or to, to strive for more, as was mentioned in the song we listened to? Or is it okay to just keep things as they are? That's a good question, and I think the answer varies a lot uh, around the world depending on where you live and what kind of circle of people you run with because uh, some cultures, they value a simple life. I think in uh, Tolkien's work, like Lord of the Rings, hobbits are very much so, like, stability is better than adventure. So if someone is doing what's expected of them and they're not really uh, breaking the mold and they're kind of just doing their job and staying at home and being regular and normal, that scene is the the higher path. And going out and gallivanting about doing crazy stuff, that's wrong and you shouldn't do that. Um, I think in the United States, a lot of it is very focused on like, what makes you unique? How do you stand out? And there's less of a, a pursuit of uniformity between people. It's more about like, how are you unique? But that'll typically boil down to like what click you end up in, like what group you're in, what kind of stuff that you like, um, that sort of deal. So it's not as though we can be super unique all the time. There's going to be overlap with other people in certain categories. Yeah, I think Swiss culture is somewhat similar to the US, uh, I'd say it's not as extreme. But also the um, social aspect of it is definitely true here as well. Which would um, bring us to, to a, a good um, other question along the line of um, Confucian thinking of how should we choose the social group we're in? Like, to some degree, it's random, I guess, but we have some say in what people we associate with. And as we just established, this has a big impact on how our life will unfold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my social group and stuff has changed quite a bit. When I was a like middle schooler, high schooler, the crowd that I ran with was kind of like a mixture of jocks and nerds and everybody was Christian. So there was kind of that as the groundwork of, I was involved in sports and I also valued my grades and my education a lot. So I hung out with the nerdy kids and I liked video games and that kind of a thing. 
but you dress a certain way if you want to be seen a certain way kind of a thing uh, Abercrombie and Fitch was like a a very desirable clothing brand for a lot of people and you would be in the cool kids group if you dress a certain way but a lot of that was just from external pressures like it wasn't as though a kid had a neutral choice between all different clothing options you got dealt a certain uh, set of parents and a certain like socioeconomic status and stuff and a lot of that shapes the things that you can choose from so i think when it comes to like initially filtering into some kind of a person you don't get an even choice of everything in the world you get some kind of subset and then any change that you have from there is going to be a process of evaluating is this new thing better more fun more desirable than what i had before And um, do you remember making that choice actively or um, thinking about those decisions? The one that was the most obvious would have been evaluating my faith, my Christian faith, where I really wanted to figure it out for myself. I had a personal quest of trying to unify science and Christianity and prove once and for all that uh, the Bible was historically sound and a scientifically sound document and I was going to write the book that tied everything together so at that point I was definitely evaluating my personal beliefs and then comparing and contrasting them with what other people had to say about different stuff and when I went to university there were a lot of people who were more outspoken against religion whereas in high school I kind of lived in a bubble where basically everyone was some flavor of Christian maybe you're Catholic instead of Protestant but um, basically everyone's Christian and anyone who isn't gets kind of bullied so it does um, raise a question of well maybe there were people who uh, were not Christian but they just didn't speak out about it that's definitely possible we had one uncle who is an atheist and it was always kind of like oh stay, stay away from that guy you don't want to talk to him one on one he's got <laughs> some some evil stuff going on no doubt so how did that book project of yours work out? Well, I ran into a problem, which was I got stumped some of the time where I'm talking with an atheist or a agnostic or a skeptic who's like, hey, there's this inconsistency in the Bible here. This part doesn't make sense. And that kind of logic doesn't really hold up. And I would be like, shit, you're right. And then I didn't really know what to do. <laughs> Like, I can't just always have a comeback for everything. I was 16 to 20 in this age range, and I'm learning stuff on a pretty regular basis. And there's a thing called confirmation bias where a lot of people, they believe a certain thing, and they just either consciously or subconsciously go about trying to find other stuff that backs that up and supports it. And one thing that happened before I left school was there were books given to me about like the dangers of evolution. So I was being pre-supplied with some information that was meant to inoculate me against opposing views, which is interesting. Uh, it didn't end up holding up too well because I, I really wanted to know the answer. I wasn't really interested in just finding ways to support what I already believed. I actually wanted to know the truth, even if I didn't like it, which not everyone is really in a position to do that. Uh, the analogy that I've given for my life and my pursuit of truth and stuff would be that everyone is investing in certain ideologies and habits and that kind of a thing. And the longer you're involved in some religious belief, the more engaged you are in church. It's kind of like investing or committing to a poker hand, where the more you've committed to the hand, the more you want to see what the outcome is going to be and the more you feel like this is my hand and I want to kind of ride this out so for people who are older they're adults already maybe they have kids and they've raised them a certain way it's kind of weird to switch out of a religion at that point but for someone who's younger they haven't quite gotten pot committed to borrow a poker phrase and I was definitely in that stage of my life where I was a firm and strong believer in Christ and I really loved my faith, so I wasn't the kind of 
a believer who was betrayed in the church or something like that. And that's why I, I started to question. I just questioned because I liked questioning and I really wanted to know what was what. And I was really curious about people who disagreed. So I had that natural desire to go out and try to figure stuff out. And I would always be extra curious whenever people were dismissive of certain kinds of questions or they recommend against pursuing it. I would be like, why? Why should you not pursue this? Or if you get to a dead end of, well, God just works in mysterious ways. I didn't really like that very much. I would always want it to sort of make sense if you thought about it hard enough. Maybe at first glance it wouldn't make sense, but you should be able to work through some steps where it at least reaches some level of consistency that you could understand it. But that was just my opinion, I guess. Some people are okay with things being incomprehensible and just trusting in God. And that is faith. Faith means that you uh, believe in something even if you don't have the most conclusive evidence. And we all put faith in some things. Like I, I believe that dinosaurs existed. There are clues that dinosaurs did exist. So I would say my faith has a fairly strong basis in archeology span and stuff like that. But I've never actually seen a dinosaur. Wait, no, I've seen turtles and those existed back then. I've basically seen some living dinosaurs. <laughs> a lot of birds are very closely related to dinosaurs. They're called raptors, like different owls and things like that. They have a lot of the same features and that sort of thing. So that's a, it's an interesting pursuit of your perception. Is it correct? Is it true? What beliefs do you have that need updating? And then you have a person's flexibility score in a way of being able to admit that they're wrong about stuff. I've noticed that that's a really important life skill that requires a lot of practice and a lot of humility to be able to enter into a discussion and to be fully prepared to be wrong and to be ready to drop some beliefs that you have. A lot of people, as soon as they come to some realization or they believe something, they just want to hold on to that at all costs. And if they ever get into an argument or debate, they want to win. So they're prepared to unload all the different reasons they have. And they're also not prepared to admit they're wrong. So they're not really engaging the conversation with flexibility. It's a very rigid, uh, pre-equipped, I'm just going to unload my magazine of reasons, which is my ammo, and then I'm going to expect to win. And if I don't, I'm just going to get mad and leave. And admitting you're wrong also, a lot of people are scared of that because they're worried that maybe, maybe I'm not as smart as that person. But that's a really silly assessment. If you're entering every conversation in your life worrying about if that person is smarter than you in general, you're, you're wasting too much mental effort. <laughs> Everyone's going to know something you don't. That's one of my favorite Bill Nye quotes. So just trying to look for the intelligence in other people and to learn from that intelligence in other people makes it more refreshing and it feels like a group quest where I'm now questing with these other people to try to figure out the world rather than I'm entering every conversation to try to prove once and for all that I'm the smartest person in the room. So what you're saying is don't do the cannon rush approach to conversation? Correct. Unless you're in a conversation where the cannon rush is what you're after, like say you're trying to make a quick comeback to someone who said something rude to you. I feel like just doing something that sounds clever and witty, that's totally fair and it fits the situation. But if you're trying to figure out life's mysteries, you don't really want to cheese it, <laughs> in my opinion. You might impress some people with your wit and your speech craft, but uh, sometimes the truth is boring, honestly. I had a big eye-opening experience for me. It was in biology class. Got to university, go to an honors biology class, and I had been warned a lot about the wickedness of evolution and how they're trying to tempt all these students to believe in it and stuff. And they made it sound very sexy and kind of like, ooh, is this some dark cult of evolution? We're just going to 
gonna do some weird stuff together in the deep of the night. It's actually taxonomy where they just list all the different relationships and families of all the stuff. And it was just like memorizing crap. And I was like, man, where's the sexy part? I was warned about this, but now I'm bored. But it, it made a lot of sense. It seemed really robust that they, they wanted to cover everything and organize it. And biology was about organizing the stuff that is and seeing how close the different things are to each other. And that made perfect sense to me. And it didn't seem like there was any sinister undercurrent of trying to corrupt me by doing so. But maybe by camouflaging it as something like a boring class, that's when they really got me. <laughs> yeah, that's how they get you. Yep. The notion of taxonomy as we know it today started with, I'm not sure if it started, but we know it as kind of a um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's um, we know it today as something that came from Aristotle. Sorry, we kn know what is it came from Aristotle? Uh, taxonomy or just oh, right. ordering things into weird groups in mm -hmm. his case things with two eyes or things with two legs right There's... and it would have been like Freud for psychology where the ways he organized things didn't end up being the best overall but the fact that he tried was yeah. a big step of progress exactly mm. things that burn things that don't burn <laughs> yeah Things that sink in a pond, things that don't sink in a pond. Throw her into the pond. There's a lot of things to be learned just by exploring weird stuff. I ever so often wonder how this worked with food. Like, how do we know today what to eat and what not to eat? Mushrooms, for example. Like, did they just go into the woods and go, let's try this one? And see how it goes? I don't know. I would think that it would be sort of a process of trial and error of like, ooh, mushrooms. And then someone eats them and then they die. And they're like, oh my goodness, what happened to this person? And if they're lucky, they notice that that person had a mushroom of a certain type. Maybe they were next to it. Maybe they brought some back and then everyone got sick and they could kind of find a correlation or find a cause. But I would guess that a lot of people have died from eating stuff that ended up being bad over the course of human history and prehistory. A lot of action going on. Um, yeah, it's for me, it's kind of amazing how we got to this point, knowing all the things we know. I assume there's still plenty of stuff we could eat and that would make or would give nice flavors to the food we're having these days. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we figured out a lot already. And I wonder, like, before colonialization, where they didn't have spices, I guess food was kind of boring. Well, would it really be before we had spices? Maybe not as good of spices as there are in India and stuff. But you can, you can put different stuff in a dish and it changes the flavor. I've been recently converted to the... Uh, instant pot fanatics i had a fanatic in my chat who was like neuro 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 and it's like what calm down do you have an instant pot do you know what it is blah, blah, blah. and they're like super stoked about this and i'm like man this is another person just trying to push some random kitchenware or whatever and they're like i'll buy you one right now so they just send me a hundred bucks i'm like oh okay shit i'll get it and i'll try it and i get it and i don't try it because it's got a hundred different buttons on it and nobody has time to figure that out but I look at it for a while and I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll ask around. And I asked a, a friend who I play WoW with about it. And she was saying, well, try these recipes or whatever. And I was like, okay, I just try some recipes and it's super easy. You just put like four things in it and then push the slow cook button and let it go. And then it's done after like eight hours. And I had it and the food was just really well cooked 
and really thoroughly cooked and nothing was overcooked and I had to do almost nothing in the kitchen. I was like, this is a miracle. This is the coolest thing ever. And then I was converted into an instant pot fanatic and I've been so ever since. But the other thing is you can just like add a random spice or put more salt or less salt or put in another ingredient that has some flavor, put in some lemon, whatever, add some bite to it and just gradually experiment. And I'll go through periods where I'll figure out uh, a mixture of stuff that I like and then I'll, I'll kind of get tired of that and then I'll do something else. Try to throw in a different random spice and see if it works and see if it doesn't. Sometimes you put something in something and it just ruins it and you're like, okay, well, it's ruined, but at least I know now not to do that again. And that's life. There's a lot of trial and error. And a lot of times people will try to tell you stuff and share their wisdom and say, don't do that, that's a bad idea. But we're not good at listening to those things. We need to make the mistake for ourselves. Do you have a good example of a dish you ruined by putting something in? Um, I don't know of a particular dish, but I've definitely put way too much salt and stuff and totally ruined it. Um, sometimes that's by spilling. I've also, this is a, a common one for me. I'm like a, a crazy spicy food person and sometimes I'll accidentally spill too much and I use Mad Dog 357, which is basically bear spray, but it's for spicy food masochists. And um, if you put a little dollop on your food, then it makes it super hot. But if you pour a lot on it, like it's Tabasco, you're gonna be crying and sweating and it's like super intense. And whenever I do that, it's like, I'm not gonna waste all this food. So I just suffer through it and it's an ordeal and I have to get a bunch of tissues and stuff. I guess it's a learning experience. It is, but it's a mistake that I consistently repeat. <laughs> so it, maybe not as much learning. Yeah, it has some upsides though. Some people don't understand the spicy food fixation, but it gives you endorphins kind of like exercising. So there, there is a feel good element to it, even within the, the pain. And I got into it from a, a macho challenge, which I, I'm the, also the kind of person who responds to those. If someone's like, I bet you wouldn't do this, dude. It's like, oh, I'll fucking do it. I don't care. Even if it's going to be unpleasant to some extent. My cousin was holding some like crazy hot sauce and he was like, dude, and I'm 13 years old at the time. So I'm, I'm not fully a man yet. He's like, dude, if you, if you have some of this, then you'll be a man. I'm like, oh, that's great. No, well, I can do that. I want to be a man. So I have some of it. And he's like, dude, my friend had some of this. He went to the hospital. I was like, wow, now I feel like a badass. And I had some. And um, I was basically the same person after that. But I felt like a badass. And then from there, I've kind of looked for those other challenges of ways to test myself and just try to be tough to do things. But other people, they aren't even motivated by that. Someone tells them, hey, do this, this weird thing that's going to kind of hurt. And they're like, no, that's dumb. And it just doesn't work on them. So what I'm hearing is that at some point when you write your biography, it will be titled From Hot Sauce to the Top of Starcraft Ladder. From Hot Sauce to Hell and Back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one dish that came to mind for me was a leech potato soup. Leech? Or leek? Leek. Leek. A leek is a vegetable. A leech is a parasite that hitches on something and drains the blood. Ah, uh, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> he put Man, leeches in his potato soup. Man, Man I thought I was crazy. nutritious as well? No, nah, it probably has protein in it. It's, an, it's a creature. It's heckin' gross. <laughs> so, yeah, leek potato soup. And we put some um, chili flakes in it. And it was really nice first time around. But we usually make a big pot of soup and then freeze parts of it and unfreeze it to eat it. And over the time in the freezer, the whole soup just took on the flavor of the chili flakes. 
it was basically chili soup afterwards mm -hmm. which is yeah i guess there's the learning experience there is if you put chili into something and freeze it you won't just preserve it as is but the things will change over the freezing period which i didn't know ha happens to food mm. or not to this degree cooking is its own form of science and also also magic we showed a really nice french movie in the local cinema i think it was a couple of months ago um it's called delicieux which means and delicious exactly and it's about a french cook at a noble house who loses his job because he he refused to apologize for putting potato into stuff mm. and the the nobles were like potatoes that's like food for the poor why would you eat that and then he starts his own restaurant which is was a novel idea at the time and a place for everyone to go not just for the nobles yeah, it's a well-made film it, it kind of introduces you to different aspects of cooking and, and how to prepare meals it was that was cool nice Oh, I, I learned something from it um, and all your or in most of your pots you have a hole in the pan handle mm -hmm. that's where you put your wooden um, spoons in for steering like they hold up at a 45 degree angle didn't know that one before Um, yeah, so a lot of things we got into there. I think one question I would like to explore is you said that it's important to, um, I'm not sure if you said, um, choose or to be wary of the ideology you choose. Uh, I guess this was bring us to the question, what ideologies are worthy of pursuing in Europe and in your mind well i would just think about the categories of ideologies one category would be the political one there's also the spiritual one or religious one uh, you're gonna have to eventually have opinions on stuff to guide your decision making if you want to participate in elections if you want to figure out what your meaning and purpose and stuff is in life so figuring those out i think helps people just get their bearings for the world and to decide how they want to influence it if they want to. A lot of the times people are basically trained a certain way and they just stick to what they've been trained with. So it's not really a, what are my beliefs? Are these correct? And then they evaluate them and they update them or not. It's sort of like inertia where they are, they start from a neutral point as a baby where a baby doesn't know anything and then their parents and their community teaches them a certain set of things which is not the complete set of human knowledge it's a subset and it's a biased subset that favors certain stuff and then people are exposed to new information and they can choose whether or not they're going to update their views or try to defend and keep their views as they are so religious category um you've got like the political category which involves like social and economic issues and assessments for a person hmm. what other categories are there for ideologies of value i guess your personal philosophy mm -hmm. like you want to live a hedonistic life for example or you want to be as sociable as possible mm -hmm. like do you live your life purely for yourself do you have some considerations for others or do you 
focus your life on the considerations for others. Yeah, I would say that's how collectivist or individualist you are. Yeah. Which also, I guess, goes into political philosophy to some degree mm -hmm. or has has some influence on it. Yeah, they're all overlapping to some extent in some area. So out of these different uh, sets, do you have some favorites or something you think is more worthy of pursuing than something else? Man, the one that's been annoying me lately is the the vitriol of the political stuff. It's so wild right now, and it's so divisive that it's it's putting people into really clean-cut categories when it's not actually the case. Like, in the U.S., people will be shouting from the streets about, the Democrats are doing this, and then the Democrats are like, the Republicans are doing this, and they're talking about people as though they're diehard Republicans or Democrats, and they're trying to make things really binary, which is not the case at all. It helps you simplify the world if you boil it down to two categories, but you're also going to lose a lot of accuracy if you do that. And a lot of people are kind of in the middle and they don't really have strong opinions about some of this stuff. So these like grand conspiracies and just the hatred for the other side and stuff, it's almost like a drug where I'm thinking about everyone has a vice or two of stuff that they indulge in that they know isn't really good for them. Uh, but you live once, so you want to like do some fun stuff that you enjoy, right? Even if it's a little bit bad. So uh, some people, they'll have a cigar now and then. And if you have a cigar now and then, it's probably not going to kill you. You want to be safe and careful about that. It's definitely a health minus, but all things in moderation, even moderation. Um, browsing intense political news, I don't think is quite as widely seen as a vice, but I think it is. I think it's straight up a vice because it hits your confirmation bias button really hard. It tells you that you are smart, you are correct, good job, you're on the right side of history, you're the chosen team, God is on your side, all this pat you on the back, ooh raw sort of uh, feeling for people. And that's definitely something to watch out for because this is a commercial enterprise selling news. They're trying to get clicks, they're trying to get views, they're trying to grab your attention and hold it for as long as they can. And the way that they can do that is by making it really dank, really mad, really angry, because that tells you that it's really important. These are so important, these issues. And if you have the wrong opinion on these issues, then the world is going to collapse under us. That's really spicy and intense. Is it really the case, or is it a little bit drummed up? I think it's a little bit drummed up. I think the um, the divisiveness in the political system in the U.S. is somewhat special due to the two-party system, where it's seemingly a lot easier to pick a side. And even though you're not too the extreme of a spectrum, you still associate with one of two sides. So it's easier to to make the other side wrong and your side right. Mm -hmm. Where in a Swiss political system where there's seven major parties and a bunch of really small ones, like the no PowerPoint party, <laughs> which I always assume will someday take power and go their way um, to power with some, uh, how are they called, uh, DIA slides, because they can't do PowerPoint. They use what slides? Um, like those old time Z where you had the photos on like these small, about four by four centimeters or two by two inch um, discs where you had to shine light through. Oh, yeah, yeah. You put it over the light and it's just like a, a big, bright platform that you put yeah. stuff over. That's what they use instead of PowerPoint? I assume so. That's like vintage. They're <laughs> the vintage party. That's cool. Um, yeah, and in a system like that, it's the, the lines aren't 
drawn in the sand as clearly so you might associate a bit more with that or a bit more with that and you gain a bit more understanding of other views in my opinion where it's like i don't know like i, I agree with some parts of their ideas i disagree with others but when it's so clean cut as in the us it you are more likely to go down the rabbit hole of seeing your side as being right and the other side as being wrong mm -hmm. people need to find that common ground the stuff that they have that overlaps a lot a lot of people are looking for the fight because the fight is dank it's intense it's exciting there's stuff going on there fights are exciting confrontation wow confrontation can be really good but if it's closed-minded confrontation where both sides are just trying to win then it's not productive it's just like you might as well play street fighter yeah but also street fighter um, feels good if you win that's true it's a pretty cool game there are a lot of cool games like that but sometimes people don't realize that what they're doing is kind of like a video game and they could chill I think a lot of things in life are um, could be seen as um, an aspect of a video game mm -hmm. and this can be really useful at times it can also be a bit um, distracting or self-destructive at other times uh, I think we talked about this before with the um, the simulation idea of whether or not like basically the plot of the matrix where we're not sure if life is the real thing or if it's just a simulation mm -hmm. and there's no real way to be sure about that like there's there's good reasons to believe that we're not in a simulation but when you're looking at the made up math for it where one reality can make up an infinite amount of um simulated realities the math is kind of one to infinity which our odds are not looking too good on that one hmm. but it, it would bring us to the question on what would you change if you had certainty either way but would would you change around your whole life if you knew this was just a simulation or would you do something different if you mm. if you were certain this is this is the real thing? The funny thing is, as someone who makes video game content, it kind of feels like I'm already in a bit of a simulation where I'm giving people advice in a virtual world. So, yeah, I would do the same, probably. Even if this was a simulation of people playing video games like StarCraft and Dota, giving them mindset advice and stuff because their their interactions in the simulation have value. It's just a, a digital realm instead of an analog one. But then it should be connected to an analog one somewhere. Are we in a tank now or what? I don't know. Yeah, I think I would do same, same. Yeah, I think this was my conclusion too, that if I came up with something that I really wanted to change, either if it's a simulation or if it's real life, I should do this um, no matter um, what it turns out to be. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to change something, like if I want to live a riskier life because um, it's all just a simulation and I'll get back to home screen once it ended once it's ending i might just want to live a more dangerous life in real life because that's i how i get happiness out of the experience yeah if you Not knew that this you, is necessarily a good thing yeah if you knew that you didn't have lethal consequences for risky physical action you could definitely do more silly stuff there if you knew you could respawn people would be more spicy about their physical moves for sure people would also go harder in like drugs and alcohol <laughs> nah it'll be fine but if you only get one uh, vessel and if you mess it up it's 
permanently messed up, then yeah, you know, tread a little bit more carefully. Which kind of brings us back to one of my most controversial statements on this stream so far, or at least by reaction, I said I've said more controversial things, which is to say that you should, like, when all your friends are jumping off the bridge, should you jump too? And the answer is absolutely. But also to choose the right friends that only uh, jump off the right bridges, where it's safe to do so. Hmm. But you don't want to be the one left behind on the bridge. True. For the most part. The theme we're kind of constantly returning back to, and I think it's it's worth pointing this out, it's no matter what you do, it's the examination of it that kind of makes the difference in terms of are you living a good life where you where you're thoughtful about is this what i want to do is this how i want to approach things and it's okay if you decide either way but like examining it and then taking the consequences out of it is what makes a big difference mm-hmm Uh, this goes back to Socrates, who, who said the unexamined life is not worth living. That's a good quote. Sometimes you can examine things, though, and you can decide that it's bad for you, but then you'll oftentimes need a pretty large amount of self-control to steer yourself in that direction. Mindfulness and action don't always overlap. I think the mindfulness or the... Um, the realization that you want to change something is um, is what comes first. And once mm. you know why you want to change something, you can find the motivation and why would you want to change it. Mm -hmm. um, and coaching, this is called the, the higher goal, where it's like, I want to, uh, in terms of the uh, smoking example, I want to stop smoking because... I want to live healthy for longer and I want to live a long life where I'm able to do stuff, mm -hmm. which is a, a, something that pulls you forward. And it's not just, I shouldn't be doing this because of like, it's seeing the, the positive outcome, not so the negative consequences, because the negative consequences are a deterrent, but it's not pulling you forward. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I don't smoke because I really like running and it's a massive minus to that. I want to run fast. So no smoking, run faster. I like running faster. I smoke and I like to run fast too, but just not for as long amount of time because at some point I'm out of breath. Hmm. I went hiking on my trip to South Dakota. And I'm super proud of my family because they all went with me. On the previous two right. trips, I just went by myself. They have this big, huge like mountain right behind where their house is. And they always look up at it and it's really beautiful. And there was one day where I was like, I'm just gonna heck and go up there. And it seems like it'd be kind of fun. But it's on forest service land. You have kind of a spotty phone signal and it's just out in the wilderness. There's not a trail or anything. And uh, it was kind of spooky, but I found a way to get to the top and I took pictures and told the family about it and stuff. And they're like, that's really cool. Maybe we can go sometime. So on this last trip, I was like, well, let's heck and go. So everyone got together and they all climbed to the top with me, which was fantastic. Even though it was really high up and pretty exhausting to get there. And they had this huge sense of achievement. It was really funny to see the transition from that first moment when they're taking that break on the way up and they're like man this sucks Ugh. and they're they're kind of feeling more of the negatives than the positives at that moment and then they they get all the way to the top and they're instantly like super energized and they're having a great time 
So that was that was cool to see. For people who haven't gone hiking before, yeah, the the up is kind of tough, but when you get to the top, you you feel pretty good about yourself. Yeah, there's something to be said about things you have to earn, where mm -hmm. it's not it doesn't just come easy, which is just it feels so much more rewarding. Yep. That's a a funny example within games where the old iterations of World of Warcraft, which are the ones that I prefer, make you work a lot harder to earn the rewards. The newer ones give you a lot more rewards, a lot faster along the way, which if you just want to play for a little bit, then that might be better for you because uh, you just want to see the line go up, see yourself get more powerful and that kind of a thing. But if you work for it for longer, then the excitement when you get it is a lot greater. Yeah, I'm somewhat skeptical um, about this specific example because the the drop rates are basically random mm -hmm. where it's it's not tied to your performance well you have to perform good in order to to kill the boss to to get a, a drop but then it's just luck whether or not you got there yeah to quote Bruce Lee though I think it's Bruce Lee success happens when preparation meets opportunity Say preparation is having the skills required to down the boss, and then the opportunity is when it drops. So you've you've gotten the the two of those lined up, and then you get your score. But yeah, I agree there. There is some randomness where it doesn't necessarily mean that the best person gets the item in WoW. A beautiful thing about StarCraft though, is that the best player typically wins, and there's almost no RNG in the game. You don't have like uphill miss. There's no miss chance that you have to grapple with stuff does what you want it to do you can argue till the cows come home about whether or not the game is balanced but it's a good game and it's pretty fair it definitely stood up the test of time mm -hmm. I haven't played in a long time it's too stressful for me definitely a stressful game I had a viewer yesterday who inspired me to make a tilt video, which I'll be uploading pretty soon. And it was about the the nature of what a lot of these competitive games are, which is uh, it's an opponent who's trying to make your situation as unpleasant as possible. And people will get into these really scuffed games. They'll be like, man, I'm so mad at this. But they're mad without the knowledge that that's the opponent's objective. They are specifically driving in the direction of trying to mess up your build, kill your stuff, blow up your base, get you upset, and throw you off your plan so that you eventually give up and get out of the game. So it's inherently frustrating by its nature. And if you don't accept that as a fact of the battlefield, you're just going to be consistently surprised and upset by it. It's like you're, you want to go and fight bears, and then you go out into the woods, and you're like, man! Bears are huge. That's crazy. I just need to run away now. It's like, you need to plan differently for this. You can't just keep going out there and think that your outcome is going to be different if you're not really respecting the nature of the beast. Speaking of bears, we just lost against a team with a bear on it. Bears are um, dangerous. <laughs> stay on this selection, please, for a moment, if you can. There's some interesting choices you have there. Oh, the the end of game one? Yeah. First time I, I paid notice to that. It's like, on the good side, you have friendly teammates. Which is kind of to say, well, they were friendly, but they all kind of sucked. Let me see if I can find that post-game. Post-game Dota feedback question. I can just find the that post-game survey. Here, I'll just put it on the screen now. From Reddit. Did you enjoy this match? You have two sides of it. One of them is a thumbs up for absolutely. One is a thumbs down for not so much. Under absolutely. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. Oh, there we go. For absolutely, you have good team coordination, close game, friendly teammates, I played well, good hero choices, 
or we made a comeback. If you I go ahead. I like the I played well one. Yeah. Well, that's a good reason to enjoy a match is you kick butt. And you played better than your usual. If you're on the not so much side of things, poor team coordination, game was a stomp, toxic behavior, wasn't able to play my hero, bad draft, or smurf in the game. So wasn't able to play my hero. Sometimes your hero gets banned at the picking and ban stage. Other times someone else picks it from you. That actually happens a lot of the time. Uh, for this match, I skipped this vote, but I would guess the closest. Um, I don't know. I, I felt like I enjoyed the match, but I don't agree with any of the absolutely options. We did not have good team coordination. The game was not really that close. I don't know if my teammates were friendly. They were kind of raging at each other. I didn't play super well. We didn't really choose good heroes, and we didn't make a comeback. But I had a good time. But I think that's because I wasn't really wanting to win the match at all costs. I was trying to work on my farming with that character. So maybe they could give an extra option for absolutely. Absolutely, I enjoyed this match because I got to practice what I wanted to. Toxic behavior happens a lot, especially in this game. I wonder if there are good role models in the Dota scene. I don't know who they are, maybe chat knows. But the StarCraft community has had a lot. A lot of big names of just pros who set a standard of respect like day nine talked about being a better gamer that was his whole bag when he was making dailies and uh, white raw said more gg more skill and that typing gg and glhf to your opponents was respectful and valuable to other people so we have a culture of manner that sets us apart and if i were to give i was thinking about this on my flight back from this trip if i were to give the starcraft scene a grade on their manners compared to other competitive esports games, I would give them an A minus. There are some BMers out there, but the vast majority of players I think are pretty much fine. They just want to play the game and the game is so fast that you can't really type as much as you can when you die in Dota. You can just BM the whole time your character is down. So that would be a force just blocking interaction in general. But uh, we have some very nice and respectful people and a lot of the pros are just really stellar examples of sportsmanship too for dota i would probably give them like a, a d plus there are some really nice dota players but i feel like anytime there's a losing team there's going to be at least one or two people who are trying to find a scapegoat and talk shit to somebody it's very, very common. The team that wins, they feel good about themselves. They feel proud of themselves. They're patting each other on the back, and sometimes they're bragging and BMing the other team. And they commend each other and all this. And the losing team, it's just a, a den of thieves of just trying to figure out whose fault it was, or at least who's going to be burned alive in the town square for this loss, because someone needs to pay <laughs> Not sure who it is. Oh, this guy has a really strong opinion about it was this person's fault. But the thing that I've tried to point out is that if you're playing in a mid to low tier game or even an upper mid tier game, everyone has made so many like hundreds of small mistakes that we can all end a match and just be like, we tried. <laughs> we made some mistakes, some small mistakes, some big mistakes, but you have five people playing a super hard game, and all five of them could have done better. And the most efficient take home would be, the match ends, you get your pencil and paper, and you write down, okay, mistake number one was I overextended in the early game and got killed. Need to be closer to the tower there. Point two, I can work on my last hitting and get more gold income by having better micro of my character. You write that down. And then the next time you go into a match, you're not going into it mad about what someone else did in some other lane. You're looking at your notes of what you want to do better. This is the way.
This brings me to an interesting question about toxicity in games or basically using games as a way to get some of the human feelings out of your system that you definitely have but don't necessarily have a good way to 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 cope with basically using a video game as a um as an anger practice do you say that's a good thing yes i do think that uh, competition is a a way that we can manage our aggression and let our aggression flow out in a way that is sometimes productive and good uh, we're hunter gatherers and i think we have that killer instinct within us of over many hundreds of thousands of years we have gone out into the woods in the wilderness and we have stabbed and killed shit until it was dead and that's a, a survival mechanism of killing shit defending yourself fighting stuff we have violence it's a part of our life and if you want to be a a good person you need to be a steward of that violence within yourself and to decide okay i have this i have these muscles i have this capacity to hit stuff and bash stuff when do i do so and when do i not that's a, that's a really tricky thing and the cool thing about these competitive games is you can just completely fuck up someone's base you can go gank someone in a different lane you can use your abilities and spells against them boom 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 stuff blows up and we get to see that outcome of aggression success and we get that it's kind of like that hunter feedback loop but no one dies we don't play video games that physically hurt people like you don't get a, a pain shock whenever you lose a drone um, it's just a, a virtual thing we might have some emotional discomfort from how a match goes we might get really tilted maybe someone's really mean to us verbally and we feel bad so there is actual pain in some of these games that we play at least emotionally speaking but yeah i think it's a a cool outlet where we can leverage some aggression in a way that is not physically violent in the world you could say the same thing about other sports like even just playing basketball or soccer or football or something like that you're working within a certain rule set that's not meant to injure people it's meant to leverage your competitive spirit but at the same time you feel that like satisfied victorious post hunt feeling if you have won in a competitive thing sort of like you would if you chased down some game and you stabbed it and then now you have a feast for your tribe So you're saying that winning a game of Dota or StarCraft is like killing a mammoth? Depends on the game. I would say killing a mammoth is like when you beat a really tough StarCraft opponent where you're favored to lose, but everything lined up right for yourself and you're super proud and you go back to the, the village a champion and you can feast for a long time. That would be like if I beat a 6K player or something. That's an instant YouTube video. I'm going to tell like five friends about it fantastic that's great sometimes it's like uh, you caught a little rabbit where you you did have a good match you have something to show for it but it was kind of standard kind of normal maybe you can feed yourself but not other people and then you have the mean bug squashing violence which is you're killing stuff because you can but not because you're going to get any value or take home from it and this is the the evil of smurfing really Smurfing would be like hunting for sport, but not for food, where you just kill shit and then you just look at it dead over there and you're like, okay, yeah, I didn't need to fight that thing. That thing didn't have a quarrel with me. I'm not going to get any value from that thing being dead. I just wanted the process of making that thing dead happen. And that's basically what smurfing is, is you're on a, a massively deflated MMR where whatever you're fighting against stands no chance so there's not really a, a competition there and you're just getting to some end result because that process is fun for you but not because there's really a value of like testing your skills and training and improving or like showing something to someone in a way that it could be valuable as like a guide or whatever so yeah there there are definitely ways that you can play these games and be unsportsmanlike similar to how you could like treat other creatures in the wild. 
uh, just want to point out that you have some cultural background bias in terms of protein sources. But box are pretty rich on protein. You just need a lot of them in order to feed yourself. True. And many people in my country and some other countries see bugs as gross and eating bugs also as gross. Even if the nutrient value is very high, there is a shop near where my parents live. That's like a bunch of organic and local kind of goods and stuff. And they have bug protein bars and it's made from different pieces of bugs. And it's like, it has all these different vitamins and nutrients and super healthy and all this. No one buys them because they're gross, but they're very nutritious <laughs> if you were to buy them. I don't think I've ever tried any box centered dish. I could imagine eating some of them, but most of it, yeah, I'm not that into that, I think. I don't. So think I guess, that I, have I guess the takeaway here is that it's somewhat okay to Smurf, but it's kind of yikes. It's it's less honorable than just playing at your MMR. The thing is, you can justify it with certain reasons, like I'm making a video of this and I needed to beat someone and show how it works, or you could argue uh, I'm working on a different character, a different style. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely the unsportsman, like, I just want to play the game and be sure to win. Because winning feels good and losing feels bad. So I want to avoid the bad feelings and just scoop up some of the good feelings and feel good about myself. And that's a an interesting life question of what in your life helps you feel good about yourself? Because I think everyone needs to feel some level of self-love and self-respect and respect from other people. How do you go about that? What are some healthy and what are some unhealthy ways of going about that? One really common unhealthy way that people go about that is to have a hateful ideology uh, where the group says that we are better, we are superior as a category above other people. This could be a religious superiority, ethnic sometimes, political, whatever. Um, it, it can puff up people's sense of self-worth, but I would say that's done in a, in an evil way. Doing it in a righteous way, I think is best if you do it based on your actions. So you, you try to strive for things that you would be proud of and that other people would be fr proud of. And you do that. You represent those things and you earn it with your actions and your dedicated effort over time. And then there's the question of, okay, how much of that positive feedback do I need? And when can I feel good about myself? Because some people, they'll be chasing that process of, I need to work hard and I need to do stuff, but they'll never let themselves feel good about it. They'll always be like, well, it could have been a little bit better if I did this or that. I've had examples in my life where um, I've achieved pretty highly in some stuff, like I got third place in an achievement hunt and i was told by my partner at the time that that was really disappointing that i got third among a bunch of other gms and streamers and stuff instead of first when a lot of people would be like hey third is third is pretty good you got a nice payout top three you worked really hard yeah you could have done some things better but uh is it okay to feel good about third place? Big life question. <laughs> I guess this highly depends on your ambition as well as on did you do well? Like basically if you got third with a average um, performance, you can be happy about it on one hand because you got third even though you didn't really push it mm -hmm. on the other hand you have to ask yourself well how far could i have gotten if i would have performed well so i guess it's it's really a matter of perspective and the the capabilities and how well you put them to tasks 
Yeah, it's always a balance too because if you're overly satisfied with really low bars all the time, then you may achieve a lot less than your full potential. But if you never give yourself any credit and you're always beating yourself up, then you're going to be miserable. So it's trying to strike that middle path if you can, where you you have that go get them energy, but at the same time you do allow yourself some legitimate rest. That's a, another thing too, is being able to rest is pretty closely linked to being able to let your brain relax. And a lot of that is based on just what you think about. If you think in the terms of, I'm never doing enough, then you can't really go to sleep very well because you're always thinking about the other stuff that you have to do. But if you can have some level of satisfaction with, okay, I did this and this, it may not have been my best day, but it was a day and we'll try to chip away at it again tomorrow. Then you can kind of breathe that sigh of relief and then go the heck to sleep. That's one of my arguments for righteous action, which is better sleep quality. If you do bad stuff and you have a, a developed conscience that yells at you for being wicked, then if you do good, then your conscience doesn't really protest too much and you can rest. If I do something, even if it's not wicked, but it's dumb, like my... <laughs> the silliest one that I tell people about was when I went to a brewery in Austin, they have a bunch of different types of beer and they had one called the 1050, which is 10.5% alcohol. And if anyone knows the average alcohol level of a beer, that's very high. That's like basically having a red wine, uh, but it's beer. And I was drinking these beers as though they were just normal beers. And it's carbonated and stuff, so you couldn't really taste the alcohol that much. And I had a lot of these. And I was, I was very drunk. And I went over to uh, one of the bands that performed. They had multiple bands that evening. And I was just I was praising this guy. I was like, man, your set was so awesome, dude. Dude, the opening, wow, so good. Like the, man, the drums, the guitar, man, is so good, dude. It was the wrong band. <laughs> I was basically <laughs> like celebrating this guy. He was like, no, I was in the, no, I was the opener. And I was like, oh, and I just felt really bad. <laughs> Then I still sometimes when I lay down to sleep at night, I'm like, man, that was so embarrassing. <laughs> Anyone else have moments like that? Nothing comes to mind for me, which isn't to say that I didn't do things like that. But yeah, I don't remember a specific example. Alcohol can make a very smart person very silly. News at 11. It slows down a lot of your systems. It's still you, but it's you with some uh, stat modifiers. Inhibition down can be a good thing. One of the fun upsides of having a few drinks is sometimes you'll just go up and talk to someone who you might be kind of shy to talk to. That can be a pretty big plus. Or maybe there's a, a conversation topic or something that you normally would kind of steer away from, but maybe you'll, you'll give it a shot and kind of see where it takes you. So you can have some of those positives from it, but then you also have the negatives. I get pretty bad hangovers if I drink a lot. So the next morning I just feel really bad. Yeah, I think I've got my drinking under control to the point where I notice when it's enough, when it's like good for conversation, but not to the point where I would really feel it the next day. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, it heavily depends on what you're drinking as well. Like it's, it's easier with some beverages than it is with others. Yeah. And it, the more different types that you mix, the more you increase your chances of feeling bad the next day. And oh, then that's a cultural bias. It, the Portuguese what? people always say you need to mix drinks in order not to feel bad the next day. What? True story. 
Oh, well, I, I don't know if it's true, but it's what they tell each other. And I think it's, it's always just a question of um, how much you're drinking as well as um, how much sugar there's in there. I think sugar has a big influence on how bad you feel the next day. True. Also, altitude. I learned that one the hard way. I had an amount that I'd had in the past before where I feel like I know my limits, but I'm 5,000 feet up. God knows how many. What do you use for elevation? Do you use meters or kilometers? I guess you use meters. Well, you could use both because they're a bit more neatly tied to each other than feet and miles are. I don't even know how many feet there are in a mile. Is, is it some sensible number? No, it's like 1,200 <laughs> some random thing. Feet in a mile. It is 5,280 feet. See, I didn't even know. That's how random it is. They probably changed overnight. But it's 1,500 meters was the elevation. Yeah. yeah the elevation is mostly in meters. Unless it's really, really high. Mm -hmm. I went up yeah, and I, I looked at the oxygen levels for different elevations too. Just out of curiosity after our hike. Because the hike took us from about... Uh, 5,000 meters to over 6,000, which isn't super high compared to like the highest points on earth, but it's definitely a lot higher than sea level. And if you're used to having a couple beers at sea level, and then you have a couple beers at altitude, it's going to hit you a little bit different. Be advised. Yeah. 4,000 is pretty high up already. You definitely feel the uh, the lower amount of oxygen, even though it's not as extreme as when you go to five or six thousand, but there's a noticeable difference. Mm -hmm. And I practice my drinking at the level elevation of four thousand feet. I guess that's why I'm able to stomach so much when I go to the ocean. Mm -hmm. I had some hot sake this evening. We had dinner with Apoptosis, the Goblin King, and Chicken Man, Fighter of Evil, and Mrs. Goblin. We had some ramen from a nice Japanese restaurant and some hot sake. It was pretty good. Nice. Pretty good mix. Just had like two little bottles of the hot sake and shared it. No one got super drunk. Beverages were enjoyed and conversation was had. And a good deal nice. of fellowship. I prefer sake cold. Cold sake. I usually, like all the alcoholic beverages, I probably prefer cold than warm. Unless you're doing coffee with um, some kind of liquor in it, which would be weird to drink cold, I guess. Irish coffee. Mm hmm. All right, so I want to steer the conversation away from alcohol since it's, I guess, not the best advice you could give people. There's good advice in there, but there's more interesting things to talk about in terms of life philosophy. Um, one subject that came up a, a couple of times is the us versus them mentality. And I think this is worth addressing and worth um, putting some thought into there's some disagreement whether or not we this is innate to people like if we need this as a social species to survive like do we need for social cohesion within our in-group do we need the the bad other and I'm not sure what the answer is there. I assume it's helpful, but not essential. But one interesting thing is the consideration of, all right, if we say we need this, what would be a good us versus them distinction that is worthy of taking on? Like what, what would be the in-group and what would be the out-group? 
think it's oftentimes based on the socioeconomic strata of what group that you're in and the needs of that group and finding common cause and being able to accomplish things by rallying together. I think just being able to rally around a cause as a group means you can get a lot more stuff done than you could otherwise. Basically any revolution that's happened has been based on some level of in-group, out-group. So I think it is a really important reaction that we can have is to make the distinction of, okay, the, the situation of the monarchs is very different than our situation. And they have all these like grand palaces and stuff and we're heckin' dying in the streets. Like there's a, there's an issue here. And you could empathize with the monarchs and think about their position, but that doesn't really change yours until you make a ruckus and like try to get them to do things differently. So I think in group out group, yes, it has a survival advantage to it. It can also be misused where you rally people for some wicked cause. And that's happened many times throughout human history and prehistory. But there are also situations where wickedness is being done to us and we're trying to uh, figure out a way that we can stand together against a problem. Strength in numbers is a real thing. So what kind of in-group do you see yourself in and what does that what implication does that have in terms of what is your outgroup? I'm a millennial and that means that I'm really good at getting offended <laughs> and complaining about stuff and being entitled and having really puffed up self-esteem, the self-esteem generation. We've got lots of stereotypes about our age bracket based on when we grew up. Uh, one of the things that's different for millennials and Zoomers is like growing up with smartphones and stuff. Um, I had a, a dumb phone. I like didn't have internet and stuff to the same extent. And then I also didn't have like tablets in the home. We had computers, but they were pretty slow running and the internet was so slow that it limited how much you could get done with it and that kind of a thing. So I would say I'm in the millennial group. Um, there's also the ethnic group that I'm in and all the privileges and consequences of that. I try to be mindful of that. I'm in the male man group where uh, I have all the biological and social consequences of that. So you're trying to figure out what is, what is your group? What are all the different groups that you fit into? And then how do you conduct yourself with that knowledge? A lot of people, I think they can sometimes be less empathetic than they could if they assume people are exactly like them and they had the same opportunities as them. Uh, one thing that was eye-opening for me was talking to women about walking around in public, especially in cities, but even just like at nighttime. I have a zero fear response when I go outside. I'm not afraid of anything aside from like if I were to stand in traffic. Um, but that's largely because I'm a, a big creature who is athletic and fast and it's not really worth it for another human to like try to jump me or fight me or something. So I don't really have a reason to be afraid. But there's a really wide variety in people's body mass and that sort of thing. And there are some people who are like evil creatures of opportunity where they'll try to jump people or pressure people if they feel like they have the chance to do so. And that's a really like ever present threat that's rather scary. And uh, yeah, that's something that I don't have to go through, but a lot of people just, that's part of their experience in life. So having some empathy about that, if this is not a struggle for me, but it's a struggle for other people and I can respect that and try to support them at least by listening and being empathetic, if I can. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you see any of the groups you listed or maybe something else where you see it as worthy to see yourself as 
part of that group with the implication of the outgroup? Mm, like, I, for example, being someone that's non-toxic in video games. What about that? Does it... Do I feel like I deserve to be in that category? No, no. If it, the, the question is, do you see this as a... Um, a group worthy of pursuing or associating with? Oh, hell yeah. It's uh, people who value even the small interactions between others. I think every human interaction has some value, even if you're never going to see that person again. I think of it as like, it's a grain of rice in the scales of their life. And maybe it was just one, like I bought a coffee from a coffee shop place. But if I'm pleasant to that person, that's a little pleasant grain of rice in their day. Maybe the rest of their day was bad, but if I give them like 30 seconds of a nice interaction that doesn't have problems with it, then that's valuable and that changes the world. So in video games, while you could say that the outcome of a match isn't really super important unless it's like a major tournament, people's feelings are in play and the feelings that people have in those matches carry over to other parts of their life where maybe they're going through a lot right now. I don't want to be a gross and poisoned grain of rice in their scales even if I'm never going to play another Dota match with them because I know that some people are depressed, some people are anxious, some people are unemployed and really frustrated looking for work and things like that. So yeah, if I can be associated with non-toxic gamers, and oorah. Nice. Yeah, th that's that was the way I wanted to to phrase the question. Where it's like, there's some groups that we we associate with that are helpful in the sense of seeing it as a in-group out-group uh, distinction. Mm. Where it's like, I like to be part of people who examine life rather than not doing so. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is something worth thinking about in my opinion, where it's, is, is this an attribute of myself I want to associate with, or is it just, for example, being male or female, is this just something that happened to me where I'm okay either ways? Yeah, I would break that down in terms of like uh, your chosen demographics and your dealt demographics. You're dealt certain cards in life, but then you also have a, a chance to choose certain things that you invest in. And you can, you can only evaluate for the chosen ones of like um, what you're going to do about it if you want to switch it. Like you can't change your ethnic card you can't really change your socioeconomic card very fast you could try really hard and drive in a direction but yeah that's a, a pretty tough one and then like i was saying before you have the inertia of your previous ideas as your anchor point and if you want to venture from that point it's going to require a lot of heavy lifting mentally to challenge your views Another thing that I think Agent Smith is really good at doing is knowing when it's okay to not pick a side. Uh, he comes on and he does world discussion with us really often, and he doesn't really say much that would tell you whether he's Republican or Democrat. And some people will tune in and they'll get annoyed. They're like, is this guy conservative or liberal? Like, what is he doing? And he doesn't want to pick. Like, he doesn't want to be a person who's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm this. Because if you do pick, then a lot of times people will be like, okay, you're on the, you're on the bad team. Or they'll be like, okay, you're on the good team, and now I'm going to trust everything you say. He would prefer to be neutral, uh, like our lovely Swiss guest here, and just have his words be taken on face value rather than coming from an ally or an enemy, which I think is really admirable. I definitely have my uh, stances and stuff more publicly visible and ready to share than he does but i think his approach to it is totally valid and definitely has a lot of merits to it
I think there's some philosophical saying you might have said it in a previous philosophy clock about choosing whether or not to out yourself as a friend or an enemy in certain situations based on the advantages and disadvantages of doing so. Doesn't really ring a bell, but it kind of sounds like something Sansu would say. <laughs> Pick, it, pick the right enemies. One of the you insert the quote and then below it it says Sun Tzu, comma, probably. <laughs> yeah, misquoting is quite common. I've seen the um if you stare long enough into an abyss, the abyss also stares into you. Mm-hmm. Attributed to Mark Twain. So I'm kind of like, all right, how did you get that one? <laughs> but this is the, the, the concept of the death of the author where it, it doesn't really make a difference um, who wrote it and why they wrote it as long as it makes a difference for you it is fair to some degree. On the other hand, if you study the subject, it makes a big difference who said it and why they said it yeah because the context can give you some additional information about the meaning they said it at this time under these circumstances so it, it is impactful in these ways and the idea probably came from these places and the descendants of this idea were this and this definitely gives you a more complete picture if you know who said it yeah in the example of Nietzsche he was um, he wrote a lot of weird stuff about women, but in his context where he was, his love life was super unsuccessful and he was quite weird. It makes sense that he didn't have a better concept of, of the subject and maybe his, his thoughts in it are not as valuable as other of his thoughts. Yeah, the other example that I talked about on my recent trip was Tolkien. In Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and stuff, there are very few uh, lady characters who are written out with much depth, and there's no point where two lady characters talk to each other, I don't think, in the whole thing. And it's not really, like, focused on degrading women or anything like that. It's just not a part of his life where he had very much experience. So I think from his self-report, it was that he didn't have confidence in knowing how to write a woman well because his experience was World War I and then reading a whole bunch of stuff. And then most of literature in his time would have been very male-focused, just because that was the tradition up to that point. So you're kind of building off of that and then slowly branching out from there. A, a good example for someone who switches up his views over the course of his life is Bertrand Russell, where it's like, it, it always depends on who he spends his time with, how he's arguing. Mm -hmm. Like when he wrote the uh, Principia Mathematica, he was in his peer group of scholars at, I want to say Cambridge, but I'm not 100% sure. Some of the big, yeah, it was Cambridge, um, colleges in the UK at the time. But when he gets a, a somewhat more spiritual girlfriend or liaison, I guess would be the better term to, to, to call her. Um, and his views turn around completely and he's trying to define love and to define God, which is quite different than, than finding the fundamental principles of mathematics. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say they're the same in some degree as well, but... Yeah, uh, can you though? <laughs> up, up to the method, mathematicians to decide. If you if you really love math, finding out its core principles might be the same as finding out the core principles of love itself. I think I, I think it's technically doable, but it involves so many variables that we can't measure that it might as well be magic. Because you could list out all the things that you would find desirable and attractive in a person. And then you could even go to the effort of 
listing out all the physical attributes, including like pheromones and body smell and stuff like that. And if you listed out all of them, you could probably predict with decent confidence who you would be attracted to and who you would not. But yeah, there's like so much in terms of people's behavior to factor in as well. You would need to do a hecking lot of math and have a lot of information for that to line up. Yeah, and a lot of reliable information, which is kind of difficult to get when it comes to, to a subject such as how much in love are you with this other person mm. on a scale from one to yeehaw. Yeah. <laughs> um, two questions about the gameplay you're doing. You're not in a normal match, are you? It's no. Some kind of practice? Yeah, this is Demo Hero, where you just like get to mess around with the hero. It's like a condensed map. You can't really go to as many places. Let me see if I can... Are there jungle camps or something? I can run up here, but there's no enemy team. I'm here by myself. It's just waves of creep that attack each other. And the reason I was doing it is I can quit this whenever I want to, and I can practice last hitting. So if you get the last hit on one of these creeps, you get gold from it. If you don't get the last hit, you don't get any, but you get experience. So if I'm playing carry, which I normally do, I want to be getting that gold number to pop up as much as I can. And each character has a unique like attack swing animation, which takes a different amount of time. And they have differing range. Like this guy's a, a melee character, so he needs to be right up next to stuff if he's going to attack it. So you're getting used to your turn radius. You're also getting used to how these enemies are attacking each other. So you know when you should go in and the timing of your strike. The story of this character, Anti-Mage, is one of my favorites. He was a young pilgrim who went to a monastery with a bunch of monks and they had their sacred texts and they're all meditating. And as they're meditating, there's this group of necromancers who come in and they're just killing everybody. And the monks who are meditating perceive it as a vision and they say, no, this is a vision. It's just, it's part of what we're seeing here. And he, he just got there and he's like, what? You're being killed. So he just grabs as many of their holy texts as he can and he swears an oath to defeat all magic and i mean that makes sense he's a young guy he saw a bunch of people killed so fighting against them kind of makes sense the thing that's really silly about his character is he uses magic to like do his spells <laughs> but don't tell him that he'll probably get upset i turn magic aside and his teammates all use magic as well magic is everywhere but he's got a a very pointed purpose have you seen Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Um, yeah, it's been a long time though. He is Scar, the character yeah. who is of that nation that was killed in, or a lot of them are killed, and then they're in a really bad spot. And uh, he swore to fight all the alchemists. Kind of the same character. So is it fair to to use the weapons you're fighting against if you're doing it for the right cause, I guess would be would be the question. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Is it okay to use magic to defeat magic users? Like Scar in the show, he uses alchemy to defeat these uh alchemists from the government. Illidan is a, a similar character in the Warcraft universe where he uses the power of demons to fight against the demons, but he is in part corrupted in this process. Yeah. To make it a real world example, is it right for me to have nukes in order to deter you from you use your nukes? If your objective is to make everyone nervous, then yes. But uh, yeah, I think with Ukraine, that was one of the questions that people had was if Ukraine had nukes, would they have been attacked or not? Because some people think they would not have been attacked because they would just like shoot a super powerful nuke at someone. And that's part of why some of these smaller states like North Korea and stuff aren't really messed with too much is because people know they have a good amount of destructive capacity and they don't want to escalate to that. 
Mutually assured destruction is an interesting concept. Basically, we should not use nukes ever at this point with how much damage they deal, and because if one goes off, then other people could just basically match that level of aggression and do the same, and it will destroy the planet in such a way that even countries and people who are not involved in it end up having their food stores killed, so then they're going to die. Mm -hmm. Nukes bad. News at 11. Uh, I can agree to that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question on, on being hypocritical if it serves the right purpose, if it's the right thing to do, or if you should stay away from it. That kind of goes down the, the way of different ethical schools where... Um, Kant would argue that you should never do that because you're doing the wrong thing to begin with. And even though you might get a good result, since you're doing it the quote unquote wrong way, it's not the right thing to do. Mm. On the other hand, you'd have uh, utilitarians who would be okay with you doing whatever, as long as the result is good. But since it's kind of hard to, to to know the outcome of any given situation beforehand, it's difficult to determine whether or not using nuke in this situation is a good thing, or maybe not need to go as extreme. Um, starting an argument in this situation would be a good idea or not. Mm. Yeah, that's about picking your battles. If you think it's worth it, if you think you can make any progress. There are a lot of times where I'll notice that I have a different opinion from someone, but I choose not to get into a debate with them because I don't feel like it would bear fruit for them or for me. If I think it's going to end up in a deadlock and they're just going to get mad, then that just seems like a negative by even initiating the argument. Even if I feel like I'm right and there might be a slim chance of them changing their mind, if it's a low chance, I won't go for it. I'll usually try to find some common ground or maybe even just cast a little bit of doubt if I think they have a, a bad take on something. Just try to ask a question that might lead them in the direction of questioning it for themselves later on, planting a seed, sort of, rather than expecting to win any ground outright. Yeah, what I find interesting is when I see someone having a view I don't understand to explore where it's coming from, like for me to to gain the understanding of why someone would argue this way or would see the world this way. Mm -hmm. And I might still not agree and see it as even worse than before um, exploring it. It's always interesting to kind of... Um, get a sense of how people get to some of their wrong ideas or right ideas. I guess that's my personal bias, seeing them as wrong. Yeah, it helps with compassion a lot to be able to understand people's reasons for stuff. They might not be good reasons and they might not be reasons that would convince you. But if you can at least list what the reasons are, it's easier to be like, yeah, OK, I can I can see why you see it that way based on what you think. So the system might be internally consistent, even if one of the like foundational facts you may dispute, which means the entire thing falls apart. But for them, if their foundation is different from yours and they reason up through it in a way that is consistent within that system, you can respect that consistency even if you don't agree. The one that I've been pretty frustrated with lately, and just all cards on the table here, I'm a, a left-leaning person who is not religious. Um, so th this would be a, an out-groups perspective now. But I used to be a conservative Christian, and I've noticed that in a lot of the recent um, decade or two, maybe, just the general drift toward a lot of people 
being motivated by anger and how they talk and how Jesus Christ is central to the Christian faith by the name Christianity. And you'll see people who will, in like one sentence, talk about it's for God, God is on our side, blah, blah, blah. They'll say all the buzzwords that make the Christians happy. And then they'll turn around and do something like super non-Christian and really wicked that Jesus would never say shit like that. And that really upsets me because they're not being consistent within their own system. Like I could understand if they're being consistent, they're following what they profess they believe to be following and they hold certain views. Okay, that's that's fine, that makes sense. But if you're you're saying, yeah, God is the way, we need more Christianity in the world and stuff, and then you're doing stuff that's like super against that. That's that's a big yikes. The issue that I think is a major factor is news and politics favor charisma super highly. It's like a, a must-have stat. You need to have really high charisma if you want to have any success in politics. People need to feel good when you talk to them, but charisma is not a, a stat that involves any ethical score. It's just like your social showmanship. And if you have that high score, people can be just so dazzled when you talk that they're not really engaging their critical faculties like they would if they were trying to do a word problem in school or a math problem where they need to make sure that everything lines up and is correct in the end. They just like hearing you talk and they're kind of along for the ride and they sort of take an average of what they perceive that you do where it's like, okay, I like 70% of what this person says, so I like this person, I will follow this person, rather than to be consistently aware of, okay, I agree with this person on these issues, but these other ones I don't, so I'm ready to offer critiques and clarification for those things. People want their heroes. They want to figure out who the good guys and who the bad guys are, and then they want to follow those people. But it runs into a lot of problems when no one is perfectly consistent, no one's perfect with their behavior, and if you just follow people blindly, they're going to take you in some potentially really bad directions. Yeah, one still common misconception or, I guess, wrong way of looking at the world is that we associate um, beauty and goodness, mm -hmm. which there can be, like someone can be beautiful and good, but just because they're beautiful doesn't mean they're good or just because they're good doesn't mean they're beautiful. I guess the second one would be more true, more uh, in terms of beautiful personality. But we, we tend to see beauty more as the um, how appealing they are to the eye. Mm -hmm. Which is not really helpful in most most scenarios true unless it's specifically a modeling or fashion contest but i agree i've talked about that bias before i think the greeks were big on that one too yeah they wanted this people was... to look a certain way and they assumed that that involved a connection with how just or ill of a person you were. But they still had ugly people um, making a good life in Greece. It's like um, Socrates was famously ugly and they always made fun of his big nose. And to be fair, they did kill him. So, yeah. It was 50-50 on that one. <laughs> He was famous, but he was also killed, so. But did yeah, they it's, it's kill him because of his nose <laughs> or for other reasons? I don't think it was because of his nose, but maybe if his nose w would have been more beautiful, they would have basically given him a pass on poisoning the youth of Athens with wrong ideas. Look, you've been poisoning the youth of Rome and Athens, but you're pretty handsome, so we're just going to let you keep doing that. Yeah. 
You can get away with a bunch of things if you look pretty enough, I guess. That's true. Confidence also, just walking to a place with conviction as though you own the place and you know what you're doing, that could get you in a lot of places. My mom has a funny story of going into a, a really fancy hotel in Monaco, which is like bordering the southern part of France and Italy where they meet. And uh, you're supposed to be a person who has a room there if you're just going in, but she just went in and someone offered her some complimentary champagne and she just needed to like get some water or use the restroom or something. I can't remember why she went in there, but she just walked in as though she was a guest. And then some of our other family members walked in and they were stopped at the door and they were like, no, I'm sorry, this is for guests only. But mom wasn't a guest either, but she, she's very fashionable. So she looked the part and they were like, yeah, this is, this is just one of our hotel guests. Sure. Yeah. Now, confidence can get you many places. And it doesn't matter if it's true confidence or if you just fake it. People, mm -hmm. for the most part, won't, uh, won't be able to tell the difference. Not in the short term anyway. It's very easy to fake in the short term. There's this saying of fake it till you make it. Which I'm not sure it's the best approach, but it's... Um, it's something that I guess is a bit more common in the US where you going to the get going through better education, you have um, acting classes is more usual in the US than it is in Europe. And this is kind of the showing you how to fake it, mm -hmm. which is interesting to, to kind of know how you're doing it if you want to do it. And I think we could take some of that away here in Europe. Yeah, there's a little bit of that just inertia by if you present in such a way that you're bringing some happiness to other people's lives, sometimes that can echo back off of other people. A really common example is just how waiters and waitresses are in the US. They're expected to be friendly all the time, even if they're having a a less than stellar day. One thing that I noticed going to France and even Canada to an extent was some people, if they're grumpy, they just grimace at you and you're like, hey, how's your day? And they're like, bruh. And that was kind of a culture shock for me because in the US, we pretend to be happy to see you, uh, especially if you're in the services industry, even if you're having a pretty bad day, just because that's the expectation of you should try to be nice all the time. This was one of our worst cultural shock when we were traveling. We went from the US to Japan and the um, mentality or the approach of people couldn't be any more different, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Where in the US, as you said, people are pretending to be happy about seeing you, even though they might not be. They, they act as if you are best friends and they might not recognize you the next day, which seemed kind of weird to me. And on the other hand, in Japan, they are much more um, reluctant about um, getting into a conversation in the first place. They are a lot better at reading um, nonverbal cues where mm -hmm. they realize that you feel bad about talking to them before you even know it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's so different that it was quite shocking. And I have to say, I, I enjoyed it in Japan a lot more. Mm -hmm. it, it was closer to what I'm used to here in Switzerland. Yeah, there's a lot of bullshitting in the US. For sure. Of like, pretending to be interested or being friendly because you're supposed to be, which is to an extent dishonest, but it does mean that there's a certain vibe of the room that's nice sometimes. Like you go to a restaurant and you get a consistently up energy experience with your person who's serving you. And that's cool. But sometimes it's really not how they're feeling. And I think you can have some pretty rich and good conversations when you have an opportunity to be honest with a stranger where there's almost no long-term negative consequence of like, 
telling them something that's kind of tough that you're going through if they might find it interesting like yeah man I'm actually having a pretty shit day this and this happened and they're like oh wow damn I hope that gets better for you and you got to vent a little bit and it's a one-time interaction with them so you probably won't need to see them again which means you're kind of safe to share stuff with someone you can confide in the flip side is it can feel like emotional baggage that you're passing along to them too which is why sometimes people will uh, hide their burdens from other people because they don't want to pass a percentage of that burden on to others i guess in this case as with many other things in life it's good to ask for consent first mm -hmm. like is it okay if i share something with you and the other person might be lying to you telling you it's okay even though they are not okay with it mm -hmm. but that's like you could try to to read the nonverbal cues there but if you're not good at that it's just you have to assume they're being honest mm -hmm. and it's like it's not your your fault if you share something with them if they told you you can if they really don't want it correct or it, you shouldn't make it your issue mm-hmm Yeah, asking for consent is an interesting concept in many things we do in life, where it's like at the end of a game of Dota, um, you feel like this player played really shit and they did so many mistakes. Just asking them whether or not they would like you to point something out or if they are if they rather um, press the I played well button and move on to the next game. Are you open to suggestions for how to play that hero? They might be like, yeah, sure, what do you got? Or they could be like, no, I think I know why I was playing bad and I'm working on this in particular. Both of those are valid and it saves you yeah. from upsetting someone. I've noticed that most of the advice that people give in Dota is like really bad advice. That makes it really tough too. If your signal to noise ratio is like 90% noise, people say stuff like never play that character again or uh, inflict self-harm of some kind or uninstall the game uh, just like generally raging at them but in a non like skill specific way very common and that usually indicates that they don't really know exactly what needed to be done differently they just know that you were not as successful as they thought you should have been but they don't tell you how to do better which is kind of frustrating yeah and then sometimes, and this is a, a thing that has life overlap as well, they give you incorrect advice where maybe it is kind of specific, but it's just wrong. And if you ask someone who is more of an expert, they'd be like, yeah, that's just completely incorrect. But they feel strong conviction about it and they feel like they're in a moment where they need to get on the soapbox and lecture you about something. I've definitely had that happen as well, where I got specifically told by a, a super high level Dota player some of the fundamentals of the game and what to focus on. And there's someone who's yelling at you to tell you to do something different, who's a very low level Dota player. <laughs> a little bit of argument from authority, but I think if they had the big picture more correct, then they might be higher rated than they are. I think one thing about here about asking consent for, for telling someone something is you always have to be okay with them saying no. Like if you just want to get something off your chest, it might not be the best idea to ask for consent because it's likely that they don't want to hear it. Mm. But then you also have to question whether or not you just want to yell it at them just because you want to get rid of those thoughts of how bad they played. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it kind of ties in with assessing the the other person and what state they're in. Because some people are in a nice nice and relaxed position of comfort and stability and maybe they would be keen to have a conversation and that's all fine and well. Sometimes people are actively angry and when you're actively angry you're not really as much open to persuasion or advice. You're kind of just mad and you want to be right about stuff and you want to do something with your anger. 
So there are a lot of points where, yeah, you might want to have a conversation with someone, but it's not the time and not the place. You'll take a rain check and try to address that with them at a later time when they're in a more rational state of mind. I'll do the take a walk routine. I haven't been that mad in life, but if I get like super mad, I'll just take a walk. It helps me dial down the anger by like two to three notches. And if I need to talk to somebody, I can usually bring it home to some coherent points rather than just, I'm generally upset and it's hard to boil it down. Yeah, this is usually true. Like anger is a lot more in the moment. Like for the most part, we don't stay angry about anything for a long period of time. Um, give me a second. Mm-hmm. Catching up with chat. Someone asked what I think of Russell Brand. I know that he's been doing like podcasts and stuff lately, but I haven't listened to them, so I can't really have an opinion. But I know that people have had opinions about his opinions. And that's something. I heard recently that Joe Rogan and Mike Tyson were smoking weed and talking conspiracy theories. <laughs> oh, the world. Is this a cognition enhancing drug? Or does it make people a little bit silly and they should take what those people are saying with maybe more than a dash of salt? A grain of salt? No. A dash of salt? No. Just pour the whole salt shaker on whatever they were talking about. How if my team holds me down all the time? It's about changing the average chance of your team to win based on your performance. Like, if you can get one of your hero's win rates above 50%, then if you put in infinity games, you will have infinity MMR. That's just math. What kind of change are we even talking about specifically? We're talking about mainly the change of your ideas, perspectives, and behaviors which is going to be linked up with the changes of your skill sets, your relationships, and so on. It's been a broad topic. We've talked about a lot of stuff. Sorry about that. Wife just came home. All good. Um, yeah, I wanted to say about um, being angry or taking your um, taking a step back from a conversation has been... It's still difficult for me. Like when... When an argument get heated, you like to kind of um, do the shouting match until it's over and one has won, which is we usually perceive ourselves to be winning. And I guess your partner does the same. Like we always find a way to put ourselves on the moral high ground, even though um, I guess on average we both lost. But the, the, the ability to, to take yourself out of a situation or out of a conversation that is not going, um, is not doing productively is really helpful. And just say, all right, let's just put this aside for now. We'll talk about it in an hour or two. And let's calm down first. Maybe eat something. A lot of time getting angry has to do with mm. not enough food. True. In my case example. I guess this stands true for most people. Man, when, one thing uh, that I noticed about angry conversations, I had some downstairs neighbors during the summer, so everyone's like windows are open because it's so nice out, and they're in a shouting match, and the guy, he repeats himself like six times in a row, 
And I'm like, I'm not in this conversation, but I'm thinking like, bro, you already said that many times. If the point is not gotten across yet, you can approach it from a different angle, maybe frame it a different way or build up a different part of the argument in a certain way, but your conversation is not making progress if you're just repeating the same thing like you're a broken record. And that tends to happen when you get angry is you'll, you'll get stuck and you stop making rational and logical progress and you're just trying to sort of like a bird flaps its wings to win in some some dance and you're just flapping your wings until the other bird stops flapping their wings and they count you as the winner but you're not actually having a reasonable and logical debate you're doing the flappy bird dance So apparently there's some people that are a lot better at this than me who just apologize to their girlfriend even though they feel they're right. Yeah, um, I haven't reached that level yet. I think that just sounds like someone is Canadian. I think <laughs> it's culturally Canadian to just say I'm sorry just to get it out of the way. In the case that you're sorry, it softens the rest of the conversation where you kind of admit that you might have done something wrong and that makes you more diplomatic in your approach. But you might not necessarily be wrong. It is important to stand your ground sometimes. There's a, a thing that I didn't even really know about because I'm very lucky that people didn't do this to me, but they'll like gaslight you, which is like systematic lying to change your perception of what's actually happening around you. People will do that. They'll just feed you misinformation over time to change your perspective and they'll tell you that you're actually the cause of these problems when you might actually be more of the victim in a situation but they blame it on you and they repeatedly say that and they give all these reasons and stuff and sometimes people end up just like buying into the the lies that have been fed to them and it can sometimes come from people who are really close to you which makes it even harder to like contest them and detect when things are going awry. I had a, a guild officer, two officers actually, who were gaslighting people in the guild. And um, I haven't had a betrayal in the guild before then. So I'm just like, I trust everybody. This is great. Everyone's cool. And when people say stuff, I assume that they're saying this with truth in their heart. They're just trying their best. But turns out they're saying different things to different people that are inconsistent and they're specifically lying for a particular objective. That's a bit of a yikes. Some people will do that. And I don't think it's always like done from a, a mastermind kind of a perspective where you have to be really smart to gaslight someone. I think it can be really simple and they just like spam the same lie over and over again to the point where you have so much of that in the number of times that it was said compared to what the truth was that you just start to believe it because you don't really have as much of a competing view if you don't stand your ground at certain points or find support from other people to just kind of get your bearings and see what's going on. And that's a big part of um, what our most maybe vital skill for knowledge over time is, which is writing stuff down like documenting things, getting some clear records of what's been going on just so you don't lose your bearings with reality. Because you get a lot of weird information in life. If you can examine your life and maybe even record some stuff, then you can keep a lot better track of it than you could just from memory. Human memory is not nearly as perfect as uh, historically it was thought to be. It used to be that eyewitness testimony was super valuable and maybe the best kind of evidence but it turns out if people are fed a certain line of questioning a van could end up being a different color than it was people could end up looking a little bit different than they did just because the new question interferes with the way that the memory was stored and it can change over time so memory is not set in stone it's a little bit flexible and it can be bent and molded in certain ways are you saying you saw the white guy in a blue van driving from the the crime scene? That's not what I said. I said, 
it was a more tan individual who was in a yellow van who was driving to the crime scene. But I can see how you might, with the way that the sun was shining, it might have looked that way. <laughs> ah, there so was a glare. The, the, the dress is, um, what is it, white and gold instead of blue and yellow? Yeah, I saw that meme. It's a dress, <laughs> and everyone's like arguing over what color it is. It's silly. It's just um, people about white balance in uh, picture taking, which I guess is can be helpful. True. Two things I, I wanted to uh, kind of put into question here with the whole uh, I'm sorry routine. So is it okay for you to to say you're sorry, even though you're not just to stop an argument? Mm, I don't think it's the best route because it can uh, mislead the other person, basically deceive them into thinking that they're right just to end the confrontation event. I know that confrontation is very unfun, so some people just want to get out of that situation as fast as possible. But sometimes it's really important and it can lead you to make your relationship with that person a lot more robust. And that's a, a big part of I think what makes a, a good pair, whether that's friends or romantic partners or whatever, is their ability to face a situation where there is confrontation and to be able to talk it out and to find out what the right answer is and to agree on a course of action together. That's the, the big money relationship that you can build. And if you're dishonest and you say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. When the person is actually wrong, then the group has made backward progress in understanding the nature of reality. Uh, the other question would be like seeing that when we repeat a lie enough times, we tend to believe the lie ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly saying you're sorry to your girlfriend, even though you're not, do you at some point feel sorry for what happened, even though you wouldn't have otherwise? Yes, I've seen this happen to a lot of people where they end up feeling like they're a shitty person in general because bad things are said about them a lot and they're blamed for a lot of stuff. So they just kind of develop the identity that I'm a bad person, I'm always a failure, I'm never good enough. So whenever that person is yelling at them again, they're like, yes, I know. And they've basically just become that because it was fed to them. And I think one interesting thing to look at here as well is um, another nice Nietzsche quote where he said, there's always some truth in a lie. Like the lie itself, for example, if I lie to um, my wife about the conversation we had and tell her I'm sorry, even though I'm not, the truth behind that would be that I value the relationship to the degree where I'm willing to lie or I, I just want to get out of the conversation. Like there's, there's, there's always some good in something bad, which is an interesting thing to ponder where it's like, all right, why did I do this? And what was the good intention behind it? And then you can kind of look at it in a different way and could see like, all right, this, I did, I did this out of good intentions. I might've done done the wrong thing um i would and how could i, would, I approach this differently another time yeah i would contest the use of the word good there specifically i would say maybe advantageous because it can be advantageous to de-escalate a conversation and like call the other person the victor in an argument for their current emotional state so you have a reason for that but it's not the the good as in righteous option in terms of being truthful. Yeah, I guess for me, every time I use the word good, unless I say it was a good meal, like there's some example where I don't use it, but usually when I use the word good or bad in a um, philosophical setting, it always has air quotes to it. Mm. It's like, all right, this is perceived to be good. 
or I myself perceive it to be good, which doesn't make it absolutely good. True. Good is a daily effort. So, uh, Fuzzy Court made me interested in reading Steven Pinker, which is um, an achievement in its own way, I guess. I'm not super fond of Pinker myself, but I always like to, to, to hear people's thoughts on Nietzsche's philosophy because it's so wide ranging and misunderstood at times or purposefully misinterpreted where it's it's always fun to see what other people read in his works mm -hmm. yeah, yeah a, so oh sorry i'm not a scholar of his stuff but the analogy i've given is that he is a shoot from the hip philosopher rather than a a super rigorous castle builder like marx or uh, who is the other one kant just write a ton of stuff and try to be as specific and detailed and thorough as possible. Nietzsche's like, he just like wakes up and says some shit and writes it down. People are like, whoa, no way. And he's like, fuck it. Yeah. That's both approaches are value. <laughs> One might be more fun than the other. Yeah. Depending on who you ask. Uh, I, I definitely argue so. All right, I think we're over two hours already. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is as good a time as any to wrap up and conclude that we still don't know much more about how to live a good life, but we've got <laughs> some good ideas. But we certainly talked about it for two hours. <laughs> this is the um, platonic tradition of philosophical dialogue where it's like you had a good conversation and in the end you realize it well yeah we don't know much more than we did before we started mm -hmm. i think it's good it can lead to reflecting about things later on i think it can also tip your decision making for certain stuff in the intermediate future as well where you recently had a conversation about trying to be mindful about conversations and being truthful and honest. And maybe there's just one thing that you say or don't say differently because of a, an intellectual conversation that you had. So even if we didn't break all of philosophy and innovate something new in a conversation, hopefully you found this useful. If you have any uh, feedback or additional stuff that you wanted to share about it or your thoughts on change, you can share in Twitch chat when I'm live or in the comments of this video. Echi Fatuma, thank you, Siam, for your lovely fellowship and conversation for Philosopher Clock. And you said you're going to be traveling a bit, so we're not going to do this for a bit? Uh, yeah, I think the first one I can be joined for would be early June. Mm -hmm. Because I'm in Costa Rica and it's a bit of a mess getting good reception there and also I guess the time we usually do it I'd be asleep in Costa Rica time mm -hmm. yeah I saw a video recently from Costa Rica of a kid and a tour guide doing a zip line and they ran into a sloth so my advice would be if you go zip lining watch out for sloths I'm not the zip lining, <laughs> zip lining type of guy. Um, this has become really apparent after they did a South Park episode on it, where they really mocked the whole idea of zip lining, and mm. I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it afterwards. Mm. Well, I hope you have a good time. They have a really lovely, warm culture there. Nice people. Yeah, it's, Should be good. It's food a lovely too. place. All right. Thanks a lot for your time. And ah, yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to point out uh, for people wanting to comment or ask questions, there's also the um, philosophy um, channel on your Discord. And I, ever so often, I take a look at it. And if there's something I feel like needs commenting on, I will do that. Nice. I just linked that in the chat. Discord.gg slash neurophilosophy channel if you have a question for Eche Fatum. Well, take care of yourself, sir. 
We will see you on the next episode of Philosopher Clock with Etchy Fatum. Nice.